April showers bring more horror movies. <laughs> hey everybody, how's it going? Welcome back. This is What a Ghoul Wants. And for those who are new here, my name is Anna. And today I'm just gonna be going through everything I watched in the month of April. So I watched quite a few movies this month and some of them are not horror. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about those, I promise. We'll focus more on the horror movies, but um, yeah, we're just gonna go ahead, get started and start with the first movie that I watched this month which is Mario Bava's Bay of Blood, or A Bay of Blood, or Twitch of the Death Nerve, or I think it has a couple other alternate titles too, so. Um, yeah, I'll just go ahead and read through the synopsis real quick. An elderly heiress is killed by her husband who wants control of her fortunes. What ensues is an all-out murder spree as relatives and friends attempt to reduce the inheritance playing field, complicated by some teenagers who decide to camp out in a dilapidated building on the estate. So this movie is pretty much a classic in the slasher genre. It's basically like a proto slasher to all of the ones that would come after it in the late 70s and 80s. It was released in 71, so it was right at the beginning of the 70s, so even before like Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Black Christmas and all of those, so. And it obviously heavily influenced films that would come after it, like Friday the 13th is a big one. The fact that it's a group of teenagers, the location is kind of like a lakeside area, um, you know, there's a mystery person going around killing people. And there are even some kills that are exactly the same as in Friday the 13th movies. So there's a specific kill that I'm sure a lot of you have seen in the second Friday the 13th where Jason puts a spear through two kids that are making whoopee. <laughs> Sorry for using that term. That was kind of embarrassing. Um, <laughs> but you know what I mean. So that happens in A Bay of Blood. So um, they definitely took some inspiration from this movie for sure. Uh, I would say overall it was relatively interesting, like it's um, pretty fast paced. I think I do like it better than the original Friday the 13th. There are some kind of kooky characters in it. There's a man who's like really obsessed with bugs, like he has a whole bug collection, he talks to his bugs. Uh, so that's not really something you would see in a Friday the 13th movie or American Slashers really. That seems a, a little bit more like an Italian flair. Uh, that they added to the movie. And then, you know, we've got some kind of bad dubbing on the voices, which is very on par for uh, Italian horror movies of the time. So, and Baba really, really loves his zooms in this one. I was getting a little bit dizzy with all the crash zooms that were happening. Um, but other than that, the cinematography is really good. And the ending especially was so wild. Like, it's honestly an ending I probably won't ever forget about. So I would say definitely watch it if you haven't and see the groundwork that it laid for future horror films. I, I wasn't like super impressed by it, but as far as like those style of slashers from the 70s and 80s, I would say it's pretty good. So um, I give it three stars, so a little above average because I do think that it really laid a lot of groundwork for future slashers. So it definitely deserves credit for that. Next up, we've got The Crazies, the original from 1973, directed by George A. Romero. Citizens of a small town are infected by a biological weapon that causes its victims to become violently insane. As uninfected citizens struggle to survive, the military readies its own response. Now this one was actually a little hard to watch for me because it was so reminiscent of COVID and everything we've been dealing with, with this pandemic. Same basic principle of having to be quarantined and the potential of infecting other people just by coming in contact with them. So very, very prescient with what we're living with right now. I did really like that spin that Romero took on, I mean, they are kind of like zombies because they are infected by something and then they go around killing people, but uh, just the fact that they are still real people and they are just trying to kill for killing's sake. It's not like they're trying to eat the bodies like zombies would. Uh, they're just going insane and they are just turning insanely violent and harming people for literally no reason other than the fact that this virus is making them, which is really, really scary. It does really uh, go back and forth between our regular civilians and the military personnel. So we do get a back and forth and we kind of see both sides of the coin with what they're dealing with. And the citizens are wondering why the military is doing what they're doing because they're not explaining it to them. And the military is trying to figure out how to solve this problem while still kind of keeping the civilians in the dark. So it was interesting seeing both sides. 
Um, I would say that some of the military stuff got a little bit boring to me. There's a lot of just like yelling over radios and talking about, you know, tactical kind of mumbo jumbo that I just was a little less interested in. I was a lot more interested in like the regular, you know, civilians and the people that are uh, trying to figure out what's going on and save their loved ones in this town. So um, yeah, I would say that that was something that I was not as into with this one, but I still totally understand why Romero included all of that stuff. I just think that George Romero is so good at making characters feel like real people. Uh, you really feel like these are just people that were living their lives in the 70s and now they have to deal with this wild virus that's going around and everything is pretty grounded in reality in this one. You have a little bit less suspension of disbelief because uh, people aren't like turning into the undead. They are just people who have been infected. So he's just really good at having social commentary injected into his horror films, which obviously you guys know that if you like horror, you're well aware of that, but <laughs> I just think it's really cool. And I really haven't watched that many um, films by him. I've seen the original Night of the Living Dead, and I honestly think this might be the only other one I've seen. I do promise that I will watch more of his work eventually. I really need to watch the rest of the Of the Dead series for sure. And I really wanna see Martin. That one's been on my watch list for a while, so I promise I will get to those. So yeah, the themes of this movie I think could be relevant at any time in history, but especially right now when we're living through COVID-19. So uh, if you haven't seen this movie, this would be a really good time to watch it. It really does hit close to home. So as long as you're prepared for that, then I would definitely suggest seeing it. So yeah, I gave this movie three stars. Uh, I did really enjoy it. I maybe should have given it a heart, but for some reason I didn't on my letterbox, but uh, definitely still suggest watching this one. And right after that, I watched The Crazies Remake from 2010. And I will go ahead and read the synopsis for this, even though it's basically the same, but... Four friends find themselves trapped in their small hometown after they discover their friends and neighbors going quickly and horrifically insane. So I actually watched this one the day after I watched the original. I wanted to watch the original just to have context for this one, because I had heard that it was one of the better remakes of the early 2000s and just in general. And I would have to say that I agree. I really enjoyed it. I think that it took the core themes of the original. It stayed true to the original, the messaging and everything like that, but it kind of fine-tuned some stuff. We got a little bit tighter story. It was a little bit faster paced. I think it kept up the tension even more than the original and the effects were amazing. We got some really cool kills and uh, just the way that the people were portrayed, the people who were infected, I thought that that was um, super well done. Like if you've seen it, you know the very first scene on the baseball field, like, oh, it's just so scary and so memorable. So I, I think that the people who did the remake really did a fantastic job uh, doing something new, but still remaining true to the original content. So I really did appreciate that about this movie. I think a big part of that was that they kind of pared down the military stuff. We didn't really see much in the way of seeing the side of the military working and um, the specific people within the military that were trying to find a cure and all of that stuff. They were kind of more of an outside force, another antagonist, like the people uh, that were catching the virus. So we got a little bit more time with our main civilian characters, which I really liked because um, it helped us really uh, attach to them and like them and want to root for them more because we got more time with them. So yeah, I was super impressed by this remake. Uh, it made my list of favorite remakes. Uh, so yeah, I would say uh, absolutely if you love the original and you haven't seen this one yet, Totally seek it out and watch it. It's definitely worth it. Uh, I gave it three and a half stars and a heart. Next up was The Woods from 2006, directed by Lucky McKee. Set in 1965 New England, a troubled girl encounters mysterious happenings in the woods surrounding an isolated girls' school that she was sent to by her estranged parents. Now, I watched this movie specifically because I really love Lucky McKee's May. Uh, that is one of my favorite horror movies. I think I would put it at least in my top 20, I would say. And so I was like, wow, I haven't seen any other work by Lucky McKee. I really should watch some more of his movies. So I saw that The Woods was streaming, I think on Tubi or somewhere for free. Uh, so I was like, okay, I haven't really heard anything about this. I'll go ahead and put it on. And I would say I was a little bit disappointed. It was made four years after May, so I was just expecting it to be 
you know, another movie that I would really love. You think he's gotten more experience. It's just going to be a good movie overall if I liked uh, one of his previous films. But um, yeah, I just felt like it kind of lacked in a lot of areas, unfortunately. I think the story just... There were good elements to it. I just don't think that the execution was there. The thing that I really loved about May was the character portrayal. Uh, we've got someone who is doing these terrible things in, in that movie and we still kind of root for her. Like we want her to make friends and just live a good life and not feel like such an outcast and be so sad all the time. And that's a little bit like our main character in the woods. She's feeling very rejected by her parents who she feels like are just kind of, um, you know, shuffling her off to this girl's school to get rid of her. And of course that's gonna make someone kind of disgruntled and agitated for being where she is. But uh, I just didn't really have anything to latch onto her to actually want to root for her and want to like her. She was kind of off-putting the whole time. And I don't really know if that's just how the character was written or if it was the portrayal by the actress, but so I just really did not like our lead very much, which isn't a good sign for a movie for you uh, to like it overall. Also, Bruce Campbell plays the protagonist's dad. And I was just really sad that he was pretty underutilized. Uh, he did not uh, appear much in the story. And I understand, again, it's an all girls school. He's not gonna be there all the time. We did see a little bit of him, but they didn't really utilize like his physicality or his um, comedic timing or anything like that. It kind of felt like you could have thrown anybody into that role and it wouldn't have really mattered. So I was also a little sad about that. And then when it just comes down to like the story, the actual story itself didn't really feel like it was very um, original. It kind of just felt like a mashup of like the craft and the faculty, maybe even a little bit of Suspiria in there. I don't want to like spoil anything, but, and the effects weren't super good either. There was some pretty subpar CGI, the woods, the um, roots and stuff move around and, uh, Kind of attack characters and those did not look very good and I understand if it's a small budget it can be hard to pull off that kind of stuff but uh, I just felt like maybe they could have done a few more practical effects so yeah I was kind of lukewarm on this one I just gave it two and a half stars because it just felt pretty average to me next up we have Eve's Bayou from 1997 directed by Casey Lemons summer heats up in rural Louisiana beside Eve's Bayou 1962 as the Batiste family tries to survive the secrets they've kept and the betrayals they've endured so this movie is more of like a drama thriller it maybe has like a few horror-ish elements in there but nothing too overt it's it's just a beautifully done period piece. We've got, you know, the summer heat of 60s Louisiana. You really, really feel that when you're watching this movie. You feel the haze and the summer sun beating down and all of that is just really well portrayed as well as just uh, the costuming and the setting. Everything is really well thought out as far as the art direction of this film. You really feel like you're there in the 60s with these characters. Eve, our protagonist, who is played by Journey Smollett, uh, she does a fantastic job as a child actress. Uh, she just has such a range of emotions and she pulls them off so well. And her interactions with all the other characters in the film is just really well done. And of course, the adult cast is awesome as well. We've got some pretty heavy hitters in this one. Lynn Whitfield, Samuel L. Jackson, Megan Good. Yeah, um, just everybody is pulling their weight in this film. And you can tell that it was kind of a labor of love on Lemon's part. And she just does a fantastic job with the direction of the film as well. It's beautifully shot, just gorgeous to look at. And uh, the drama is there. There is a bunch of stuff happening. I'm not going to get into the specifics of the details because I do really think you should watch this and see it for yourself. So it's just a really beautifully done coming of age story. And I gave it four stars. Next is a non-horror film. I won't spend a ton of time on it, but I did want to talk about it because I really liked it. And that is Walk Hard, The Dewey Cox Story. Now, this is one I'm surprised I hadn't seen before because it was really big when I was in high school. Uh, people really liked it. And for some reason, I just never saw it. But And for those who haven't seen it, it's basically John C. Riley doing a parody biopic of Johnny Cash. And I gotta say, it was really, really well done as far as music parodies go. It pulls from a bunch of different music documentaries. The songs are really well done. All the parody songs are just, first of all, really good songs, but the lyrics are just really cleverly written. And we have a ton of amazing cameos from a bunch of really talented comedians. 
Um, John C. Riley just does an incredible job. He is so funny. I mean, the performances from his singing to the comedic acting to uh, the moments where he had to be maybe a little bit more uh, in touch with the drama of the story. So I gave this four stars at a heart because I really did enjoy it. And I could absolutely see it becoming a comfort movie for me. So if you're looking for something, if you're having a bad day and you want to put something on that will just make you laugh and have a good time. This is absolutely the movie for that. It is so good. Next up, we've got The Ruins from 2008. Americans Amy, Stacy, Jeff, and Eric look for fun during a sunny holiday in Mexico, but they get much more than that after visiting an archaeological dig in the jungle. So I watched this movie because I heard that it was a pretty underrated early 2000s movie, and I gotta say that I do agree. I think that more people should watch this and talk about it because I'm always looking for some good plant horror, like we talked about in the woods. Uh, they tried to do it there, and I thought it was kind of subpar, and I think The Ruins is a really good example of some plant horror that is really effective. So this is another movie that kind of reminded me of COVID because these characters are having to be quarantined at the top of this archeological site because they come in contact with these plants that they find out are basically killer plants. <laughs> so uh, yeah, it was very much COVID in that regard because these characters can become infected and they have to be kept away from other people. Otherwise it's gonna spread like wildfire. The body horror that comes along with the plants is really, really good, really well done. I was kind of surprised by it, honestly. I was not expecting to get the kind of body horror that we did in this movie. This isn't a movie that's gonna blow your mind in terms of plot or anything like that. It's not like a super original story or anything, but for what it is, I think it's really well done. It has some really good, tense, horrific moments in it, so. So I gave The Ruins three and a half stars and a heart, and I could absolutely see myself going back and rewatching this and maybe making this kind of like a summer movie watch, because it definitely has some good summer vibes since it's set in Mexico. So we've got the beach and the sun and all of that, so. Next up, we have The Hitcher, the original from 1986. On a stormy night, young Jim, who transports a luxury car from Chicago to California to deliver it to its owner, feeling tired and sleepy, picks up a mysterious hitchhiker who has appeared out of nowhere, thinking that a good conversation will help him to not fall asleep. He will have enough time to deeply regret such an unmeditated decision. So I had heard a lot of good things about this film. I know that there are a lot of people who really, really love it and cite it as one of their favorite horror movies. And I guess I was just kind of expecting it to be more of a cinematic movie. Uh, it felt kind of more like a made-for-TV film to me. I didn't really look into it, so I'm not sure where it premiered or anything, or if it was, um, maybe it wasn't theatrical and it was a made-for-TV movie. I don't know, there was just something about it that maybe it took me off guard. I wasn't expecting it to just kind of kick into gear and uh, be this non-stop ride of just wildness happening the whole time. So maybe that's just more on my end for having certain expectations. Uh, which I probably just shouldn't do, even though I've heard stuff about it. I should just go in with a really, really open mind, but sometimes it's hard to do that when you have heard a lot about a film. That being said, I did think that the premise was really cool. Uh, just the idea of a man who you pick up and he will not leave you alone. He just keeps following you. He is relentless and you were just trying to do the nice thing and the right thing by uh, picking up a stranger and getting them to where they need to go. They don't have a ride, um, you know, just trying to be a good person and having that come back and kind of bite you in the ass, so. And I thought our lead cast did really well, especially Rudger Hauer. I think that he did an amazing job at just being this, you know, uh, sociopath, psychopath that doesn't really have anything to live for other than the thrill of killing people and tormenting people, so. Uh, I mean, I thought he carried off that character really well. Yeah, I guess I just didn't know that I would keep upping the ante and that we wouldn't really get any relief from that. Uh, so it kind of just felt maybe not one note, but they were just pushing on the gas harder and harder. And I just maybe needed a little bit of space to breathe. But uh, I think if I watch it again and I go in knowing what I know now, that I will probably like it more and just be ready to go on this wild thrill ride that the movie is trying to take me on. So, so I gave The Hitcher three and a half stars and I thought that my letterbox review for this one was pretty funny, but <laughs> I said, Jim Halsey, what do you want? John Ryder, 
I've been trying to reach you about your car's extended warranty. <laughs> kind of a stupid joke, but I thought it was funny. <laughs> So the next movie I watched was In Fabric from 2018, a haunting ghost story set against the backdrop of a busy winter sales period in a department store following the life of a cursed dress as it passes from person to person with devastating consequences. So, uh, In Fabric, this movie, <laughs> what to say about this movie? Um, I guess I'll start with my letterbox review. I gave it three and a half stars and my letterbox review, I just said, the girls that get it, get it. And the girls that don't are me. <laughs> I didn't really get this movie. I don't know if it's one of those that you're supposed to get or if it's just kind of something where you let these ideas and images and themes just sort of uh, wash over you and you just experience it as it's happening to you. Yeah, I mean, I was just kind of confused at the structure. We take a pretty hard turn in the middle of the movie, like right in the middle, we switch who we're following. Um, we still have the central theme of this cursed dress being a part of it, but it just feels very abrupt and we kind of are made to uh, switch directions with who we're following. And um, I mean, they're, they're all kind of connected. I know this isn't really making any sense, but neither did the movie. If you've seen it, please chime in in the comments and let me know how you felt on a first viewing because uh, yeah, it was just kind of like, whoa, what is going on in this movie? <laughs> the tone is definitely comedic. Um, we definitely have some parts that are overtly funny, uh, but there are also some pretty tense and scary moments too. Uh, it was definitely riding that line of horror comedy and it felt kind of giallo-esque. We don't have like a a black glove killer or anything like that, but just the way that it was shot and kind of the, some of the performances from some of the actors felt very uh, European uh, giallo style of acting. And we get a little bit of Suspiria influence as well, I would say, um, just having these sort of witches in this department store, I guess you could call them. Yeah, I mean, uh, the acting was really good. The cinematography was beautiful. It was a really well shot film. All the costuming and the sets and everything were really well done. So I definitely don't want to say that it's a badly made movie by any means. I just think the story and the way it went, I wasn't ready for. And maybe on a rewatch, I will appreciate it more. But I was just a little bit thrown off by everything that was happening. So that's why I gave it three and a half stars. But um, yeah, maybe on a rewatch, I will quote unquote get it more or maybe I won't and it's just one of those movies that isn't really going to be for me but that's okay. Next I'm going to talk about three movies at once and that is the Fear Street Trilogy. I know I'm really really late to the party with watching these. These came out last year on Netflix and I'm really glad that I finally watched them because I really had a fun time with them. I'm just going to talk about them as a whole because they all kind of fit into each other. Uh, if you've seen them, you know, all the stories are kind of interwoven and the characters, they all have stuff to do with each other. It's not separate stories, separate storylines and plots and things like that. Um, they are in their own way, but they all kind of fit together like a puzzle piece. So I never read the books as a kid, so I didn't have any kind of basis of knowledge about the Fear Street universe or anything like that. But uh, I thought that all of our main characters were really likable and uh, the actors that portrayed them did a really good job. And I just thought that they were really sleek, really, uh, you know, modernized, even though they were set in certain periods. It all looked very much like modern film style of shooting and all of that. Uh, I appreciated all of the settings, you know, we got the 90s, the 70s, and the 1660s. So I thought that those were all really well done as well. Um, apart from some of the accents from some of our actors in the first part of uh, part three, so the era where we're in 1666, I thought that some of the accents were a little bit iffy, but I get it, you know, um, those kinds of things aren't necessarily everybody's forte. So uh, some actors did a little bit better with it. Others, you could kind of tell they were struggling, but they were trying. So the effort was definitely there. And even though they were all set in these different settings with, um, you know, the various storylines, I thought that they were all kind of cohesive and I think that really has to do with having one director for all three films. And I'm so stoked that we got a female director to direct them. Uh, Lee Janik did a really, really good job with the direction in all of the films. All of the killer designs of, uh, you know, basically the witches, like minions uh, throughout the timelines, I thought that every one of those was really cool. And I really would like to know for those who have read the books, are all of those characters actually in the books? like? 
uh, the little boy with the baseball bat and like the milkman. I guess I could just Google it. It'd probably be pretty easy to find, but um, if you have read the books, just let me know how you felt about the movies in general, just how things were portrayed. And um, did you like the vibe of them? All that kind of stuff. So please let me know. I really liked the uh, sort of symbolism of having uh, Shadyside and Sunnyvale being kind of two halves of this whole larger area and it being split of having like the haves and the have nots basically. And, um, you know, Shadyside having all this history of violence and murder and just having a bad reputation. Whereas Sunnyvale, you know, is very successful, very clean, uh, you know, very much like suburbanized type of area. So we see that there's actually corruption uh, leading back centuries to why Sunnyvale is able to succeed the way it is and why Shadyside just can't help but um, get out of this reputation of being a bad place. So um, yeah, just having all the resources and stuff going to one side of town and the other side is kind of just left to fend for itself and gets kind of stuck in this cycle of violence and poverty. And I think that is very, very much what's happening in America today. Um, you know, it's something that has been a part of our history since we were a country, since we were founded, which is really cool how they go back into the 1660s to show that it started all the way back then. And I'm not going to spoil anything for those who haven't seen it, but you'll know what I'm talking about when I say that. So yeah, I just thought that that was a really cool uh, way to go about the story and make it relevant to what's happening nowadays, even though it's set, you know, in the 90s and even farther back in time. So overall, I think this trilogy of movies is really fun. I gave the first two parts three stars and hearts, and the last part three and a half stars and a heart. So they all got hearts from me. I really did enjoy them. Definitely would recommend watching the Fear Street Chill. Definitely would recommend watching the Fear Street Chill. Blah. Definitely would recommend watching the Fear Street Chill. Chil I can't say it. So yeah, I would definitely recommend watching the Fear Street Trilogy. Fear Street Trilogy. I cannot say that. Fear Street Trilogy. There we go. <laughs> and the next movie I watched in April was The Burning from 1981. A caretaker at a summer camp is burned when a prank goes tragically wrong. After several years of intensive treatment at a hospital, he is released back into society, albeit missing some social skills. What follows is a bloody killing spree with a caretaker making his way back to his old stomping ground to confront one of the youths that accidentally burned him. Now, I'm not going to talk much about this one because I did do a whole reaction video on it, so I'm going to link that in the description and I'll probably put a card up here. Uh, if you guys want to go watch that, because I did really have a fun time watching The Burning and reacting to it in real time so you can kind of see how I feel about different scenes and things like that as they happen. I will just say that I gave this movie two and a half stars. I did really enjoy it and I just think it's a fun summertime cheesy 80s slasher that I'll probably end up watching, you know, maybe not every year, but around summertime to get those good summer horror movie vibes. Next movie I watched, another non-horror movie, and one I'm also not going to talk about for very long, and that is The Beauty and the Beast live action remake from 2017. And my review for this on Letterboxd was just woof. <laughs> Gave it one star, didn't like it, thought it was pretty unnecessary. Of course, most of these live action remakes are cash grabs by Disney. This one especially felt like it because there was almost no creativity put in. It was like the same exact movie, just with live action actors and some really bad CGI. All of the songs that were added in that weren't in the original movie were really bad. They were not memorable or catchy or anything like that. Um, all the acting was pretty subpar bland. The actual singing was auto-tuned like crazy. It did not sound good. Just the way that it was shot and the way that scenes were staged was really boring. The camera work was really flat. Uh, the musical numbers, like the one in the bar where Gaston is singing, it's like, come on guys, you guys are used to doing musicals. Why is there not like some really good dance sequences where we're doing a lot of like stunts and tricks and stuff. It was just like really boring. Like it almost felt like a high school production on film. Um, yeah, <laughs> did not like it. I almost didn't finish it. I was watching it with my husband and we had to split it up into two days because I was just like, I'm done with this. About an hour in, I was ready to just call it quits and, and not continue watching it. So we followed up the next day and finished it. But yeah, the one star was basically just for the costuming. I thought the costuming was pretty good. Other than that, I would definitely say don't watch this movie. <laughs> Do not waste two, how long was it? 130 minutes on this film, over two hours. Yeah, just completely unnecessary. So, and I'm not gonna waste any more time talking about that film. So moving on to 
The Batman from this year, 2022. And again, this one isn't horror per se. Um, it's kind of like a, you know, DC darker uh, superhero movie. Of course, you guys know what Batman's all about. Uh, I will just say was not a huge fan of it. Why was it so long? It was three hours, y'all. Why? For what? I absolutely think they could have split it up into two movies, having one be like the mob stuff and the Catwoman background and all of that. And then the second one could be all the Riddler stuff. I thought that they were pretty much unrelated. They were trying to cram a lot of exposition in, just too much. There was too much going on. Too many characters, too many villains. Not enough Alfred. Uh, we barely got any Andy Serkis. I was very upset about that. I thought that Robert Pattinson's performance was meh. He was very one note, very emo the whole time, just being very, uh, you know, dark and sullen. And uh, we didn't really get to know about him as a character, like himself as a character. There was no character development, although he was telling you that there was. Like, he was vocalizing that he went from vengeance to hope, I guess? I don't know. I didn't really see that. He also just didn't do as much fighting as I wanted him to. Like, I like the variety of him doing research and stuff, but it just didn't really feel like a superhero movie. I don't know. And his relationship with Catwoman, I felt very forced. There was, like, not really much chemistry. When they kiss, I was just kind of like, ugh, why is this happening? So yeah, guys, I was not a fan of this movie. I'm really sorry to those who liked it, you know, to each their own, it just wasn't for me. So I gave it three stars. <laughs> Next, I watched Starry Eyes from 2014. A hopeful young starlet uncovers the ominous origins of the Hollywood elite and enters into a deadly agreement in exchange for fame and fortune. This is another one that I had heard really good things about and I was really excited to watch. And I think it's one really good example of what you can do with a small budget, but if you have, you know, a compelling idea and you have ways that you can execute that idea, that it doesn't really matter that you don't have, you know, huge studio budget, you can make something that's still really compelling and really well done. I had heard that the director and the writer did a Kickstarter to fund this movie. So this is the kind of stuff that indie filmmakers can do when they get the budget that they need uh, it's not, you know, millions of dollars by any means, but it's enough to execute the vision that they have in their minds. So, uh, yeah, I really, really enjoyed this film. We've got this struggling artist who just wants to be an actress. She is trying to uh, still survive by working at this crappy fast food restaurant. There is some comedic stuff in there as well. I mean, the whole uh, restaurant, it's called like Taters something. Um, it's really goofy and there's some really funny parts in there, but I think it's also a really real portrayal of someone who is struggling to make ends meet and they have a dream that they want to uh, fulfill and achieve and they just can't do it because they're so burnt out on this other thing that is distracting them. It's paying the bills and everything, but it's taking time away from the thing that they really love doing, but they're just not making money from that thing that they love. So. I thought that was so accurate. I can absolutely relate to that. And that's absolutely the reality for tons of Americans. I mean, millions of people who literally can't do anything but work because they're not making enough money to survive, basically. And that's a whole other conversation about, you know, the national minimum wage and all of that. We won't get into that right now. But um, I just thought that was a really realistic uh, baseline for the story and for our character and how she's so desperate. She wants to make this dream happen that she'll do pretty much anything, which includes making a deal with the devil, so. And uh, the gore in this movie really took me by surprise. I was not expecting it, but I thought that it was really well done and really made sense within the context of the story. And it does get pretty gross, I will say. I'm not one that gets grossed out super easily, but there were some moments where I was definitely cringing at some of the gore and the gross out moments that were happening, so uh, I still really enjoyed those parts as well. And in my letterbox review, I said, I can't put my finger on exactly why at the moment, but I found this movie very cathartic. And I'm still kind of trying to parse that out of exactly why I found this movie cathartic, but I just did, I don't know. I just kind of identified with this lead female character. I don't know, there was something about it where I was like, okay, this is giving me some kind of catharsis. But yeah, for that reason, I gave it four stars and a heart. I really enjoyed it and I definitely think this is one that I will continue to go back to. Next up is Sea Fever from 2019. The crew of a West Ireland trawler marooned at sea struggle for their lives against a growing parasite in their water supply. This is one that I watched on a whim. I was kind of in the mood for some sea horror 
And I would say that the concept was pretty interesting. It was another one that kind of reminded me of what's going on with COVID. Um, people getting infected and, you know, being stuck in a small space with people, trying to not catch whatever they have. Uh, it was also really reminiscent of The Thing. There were a lot of elements that were similar. Uh, so instead of it being, you know, set in a snowy Arctic uh, tundra, it was out to sea. Uh, these people that are still isolated on their boat, just like the guys at the base in the thing so and then they find this organism that starts infecting them there's a scene where it's especially reminiscent when um they are looking into people's eyes because you can tell that they're infected they get these like uh floaties in their eyes or something's going on there's like an organism you can see in their pupil so everybody's going around getting checked in their eyes uh, with a flashlight and that was really really reminiscent of the scene where uh they're testing the blood in the thing so uh, yeah, it just kind of felt a little bit unoriginal. Maybe it was trying to do somewhat of an homage, but it just felt a little too similar for my taste. I think they could have maybe switched it up a little bit. And I just didn't really latch on to any of the characters. I thought that they weren't like super well developed and I just didn't really care about them all that much. I will say that the creature design of the organism that they come in contact with that ends up infecting them was pretty cool. Uh, but other than that, I just thought it got a little bit repetitive and I got a little bit bored by it, unfortunately. So it was just a little bit above average for me. So I gave it three stars. Next up, I watched Tone Deaf from 2019, directed by Richard Bates Jr. A woman leaves for a quiet weekend in the country after losing her job and imploding her latest dysfunctional relationship. She rents a country house from an old fashioned widower who's struggling to hide his psychopathic tendencies. Soon, two generations collide with terrifying results. So I decided to watch this because I really liked uh, Excision, which was directed by Richard Bates Jr. Uh, I believe it was 2014 that movie came out and I really liked that film. So again, this was another instance where I liked the uh, first film I saw from this director and so I wanted to see more of their work. And this one was a lot heavier on the comedy horror. Uh, it was really split between the two and I think an alternate title for this movie could be Tone Shift because it really goes back and forth between the two a lot and it was a little hard for me to grasp onto at first because of the hard turns that it takes from comedy to horror and combining the two. If you go in with that in mind and you're ready for some pretty blatant jokes while there's still being some pretty graphic horror elements, then I would say uh, you might like this film if you're into horror comedies like that, especially ones that are heavy on like the satire and stuff like that. And we've got things like one of the characters is constantly breaking the fourth wall. So yeah, it's just, it's different for sure. And I do appreciate the um, limbs that Richard Bates Jr. went out on because I think he had a very specific vision. In my review, I said, I could see myself liking this more on a rewatch knowing what the vibe is. It's definitely an acquired taste as it has a very interesting blend of comedy and horror. So I totally still subscribe to that thought after kind of marinating on it. And I do think if I rewatched it, just knowing what it's like, that I would enjoy it more. I did give it three stars. Maybe on a rewatch, I'll give it a little bit more or heart. But uh, for now, it's something where I just kind of had to uh, experience it and get to know the tone and the vibe. So uh, yeah, just go into this knowing that it's going to be a little bit quirky and a little bit offbeat as far as the tone goes. So <laughs> next is Friday the 13th part three. I'm sure you all know what this is about. I'm not gonna read the synopsis and I'm not really gonna go into it because I did watch this on a live. I did a live stream where um, I had never seen this movie before. So I was watching it in real time and talking about it, chatting with the folks who had joined the live stream, which was really fun by the way. And I am looking forward to doing a lot more live streams like that. So please keep an eye out on my channel. I've been trying to post in my community tab when I do live streams like that. So keep an eye out for that. But um, that is saved to my feed now. Uh, live streams, they just get posted as a normal video after you end the live. So if you wanna see me react to uh, Friday the 13th part three in real time, please head over to that video and watch that uh, so you can see how I feel about it in the moment. But I'll just say I gave it two and a half stars. The 3D stuff was really goofy and funny. Uh, and the kills were pretty good. I thought that um, those were well done. And I did love having our hockey mask Jason finally come into the picture. So 
yeah, uh, please go over to that video if you want to just see me react to the whole thing. Next is Mulholland Drive from 2001, directed by the incomparable David Lynch. Blonde Betty Elms has only just arrived in Hollywood to become a movie star when she meets an enigmatic brunette with amnesia. Meanwhile, as the two set off to solve the second woman's identity, filmmaker Adam Kasher runs into ominous trouble while casting his latest project. This is such a well-known film. I'm sure a lot of you have at least heard about it, if not seen it. Uh, this is another one where I was like, I need to watch more David Lynch. I've only seen Twin Peaks and Eraserhead, so I really need to flesh out his filmography because he is such an iconic director. And this one, you know, it isn't really horror. There are some parts that are a little scary, a little jarring, and you could consider horror elements, but overall I wouldn't say it's horror, so. And I really can't go into this film because it's just, it's so confusing. For those who have seen it, you'll know what I'm talking about. It's really hard to talk about. David Lynch really likes leaving things open-ended and ambiguous in his films, and this one is no different. So uh, I just really am still processing it. Uh, I'll read my review because I just said, I truly have no idea how to rate this film. I'm still processing it and I don't know if I'll ever stop processing it. So yeah, I have no rating for this film. It's gonna take a couple more rewatches for me to parse some stuff out. And even then, I don't know if I'll be able to rate it. So uh, that's all I have to say about Mulholland Drive. Next up is The Babysitter from 2017. When Cole stays up past his bedtime, he discovers that his hot babysitter is part of a satanic cult that will stop at nothing to keep him quiet. Yeah, guys, I had so much fun with this movie. Um, it was so over the top, so outrageous, but in the best way. Uh, amazing gore effects, the performances from Samara Weaving, of course, was amazing. And all of the supporting cast, all of those side characters were so fun. I thought that our lead, Cole, did a really good job. And yeah, this is just one that was a fun ride from start to finish. I absolutely will be watching this again. I think it will make my list of probably horror comfort movies. I think this is one that you can just throw on. You just need to sit back, relax, and watch a really fun horror comedy. I know some people might complain a little bit about the setup taking too long, but I really didn't mind that. I think it really got us to know the main characters of Cole and B and really care about them and their relationship. And then when that scene, you know the one I'm talking about, if you've seen this movie where everything kicks off, it is just nonstop fun from there. So I really do think that I'll be going back to this movie again and again, and I gave it four stars and a heart for that reason. And next I watched the sequel, uh, The Babysitter Killer Queen from 2020. Two years after defeating a satanic cult led by his babysitter B, Cole's trying to forget his past and focus on surviving high school. But when old enemies unexpectedly return, Cole will once again have to outsmart the forces of evil. After watching the original, I wouldn't really know what could be added to make it even more over the top, but somehow the sequel did that, and I really appreciate it for that. It's following the rule of sequels according to Randy, where you have to pump up the gore and the kills and all of that, so. Number one, the body count is always bigger. Number two, the death scenes are always much more elaborate. More blood, more gore. Carnage candy. I thought that was really fun. I gave it three and a half stars and a heart because I did feel like I liked it slightly less than the original. But honestly, if I could change it to like 3.75 stars, I think that that would be more accurate. Obviously, Letterboxd doesn't allow for those kinds of ratings, but uh, it was just a little bit less than the original. But honestly, I would totally watch both of these movies back to back. They are so much fun, such a blast. It can be really hard for a sequel to live up to the original, of course. Generally, it's uh, not even close to the original. But I think that Killer Queen really, really did a fantastic job just keeping the tone of the original. And I love that we got basically the same entire cast from the first one back, which was amazing. So I just thought it was really fun. So Killer Queen and the next two movies I all watched in the same day, I went kind of wild on the 28th of April. So the next one I watched was The Rental from 2020, which is Dave Franco's directorial debut. Two couples on an oceanside getaway grow suspicious that the hosts of their seemingly perfect rental house may be spying on them. Before long, what should have been a celebratory weekend trip turns into something far more sinister. So the first two thirds or maybe even three fourths of this film is basically just a drama. We really don't get the horror stuff until the very, very end. I think they should have introduced that stuff way earlier in the film. It kind of felt throwaway. Like it was just kind of added as a shocker at the end. And I just didn't really understand why it was so limited in the story. I don't know. I was just like, why is this happening now? 
why didn't they do this like halfway through? I hope that's not too much of a spoiler, but really, I just, for anybody who hasn't seen it, just be prepared for there to be a lot of buildup for not much payoff. Sorry, Dave Franco. Um, it was a well-made movie. I thought that it was shot beautifully and there's a lot of talent behind it. Like the actors did a good job. I just thought the story was pretty lackluster and honestly not worth watching for the payoff. So I will say there was a very cute French bulldog in there. So I did enjoy seeing him on screen, but uh, yeah, I just gave this three stars. It was just barely above average for me. And most of that was for the technical stuff and not the story stuff, but uh, yeah, it was just okay. And last but not least, the last movie I watched in April was The Reflecting Skin from 1990. A young boy tries to cope with rural life circa 1950s, and his fantasies become a way to interpret events. After his father tells him stories of vampires, he becomes convinced that the widow of the road is a vampire and tries to find ways of discouraging his brother from seeing her. I know some people don't consider this movie horror, but I felt like it was definitely more of a subtle, more understated kind of horror. Some people might just call it a drama, maybe a thriller. There are definitely some horrific images and uh, themes to it. So it's just more like subtle and existential horror. I absolutely love the way it's filmed. We get these gorgeous shots of these wheat fields that just look like seas of gold. It's absolutely beautiful how they sway in the wind. And um, the little kids who are our main characters will pop in and out of the wheat and it's just really striking. Yeah, the art direction was really, really good. Everything was just kind of ethereal and magical while still having this underlying tone of um, dread. And we get a sense that these characters feel very stuck where they are, even though they're in these wide open fields, they're just stuck in this rural town in the 50s and uh, they feel like there's kind of no way out. And it's definitely a coming of age story. Our lead is this little boy who, I think he says he's nearly nine in the film, so eight years old. And he's played by Jeremy Cooper, who I thought did a pretty good job. Sometimes child actors are hit or miss. I think that there were some moments where I felt like I needed a little more emotion from him, but that didn't really put me off too much. I still thought he did pretty good. It is a really beautiful movie to look at. Meanwhile, it's exploring these really frightening and um, very real themes of loss and heartache and death and murder and so many things. I, I can't even get into it all right now because there's so much to unpack, but it's definitely a loss of innocence, coming of age type story that I think more people should see because yeah, it's just really something special. Uh, so I gave this movie four stars and a heart. So that is everything I watched in April. I know this is gonna be another long one. Thank you so much for watching. I really, really appreciate it. Of course, if you aren't subscribed to my channel, please consider subscribing. That really helps out my channel a lot. Also liking my video if you enjoyed what you saw today, commenting, all of that kind of stuff really helps me out a lot. So thank you so much for watching everybody. I hope you all have a great day and we'll talk horror next time.